This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to every single one of you, including Dustin Campbell, Tim Deputy, and Brandon Brooks. Coming up on DTNS, what the heck is Blue Sky and why are all the cool kids talking about it? Plus, an open standard to stop misuse of Bluetooth trackers. And Nika Monford tells us about a leader in the effort to represent black people in the field of artificial intelligence. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, May 2nd, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From the Atlanta area, I'm Nika Monford. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chen. Oh, my friends, uh, we've got a lot of practical news. And if you've been hearing all the folks talking about Blue Sky, we've got that news as well. We're we're all on it. Uh, so we're going to explain it to you. Let's start, though, with the quick hits. Apple issued its first rapid security response update available for iOS 16.4.1 and macOS 13.3.1. Apple introduced rapid security response in iOS 16 and macOS Ventura. It moves some system files that are likely to need more frequent updates, particularly WebKit related files, into their own secure volume, which then reduces the size of patches and the time it takes to install those patches. In some cases, they can be installed without a reboot. The first public update does require a reboot, but it was smaller and faster to implement. No word on the specific flaws addressed in the update. Some people, though, experienced an error when it first rolled out. Apple has now fixed that issue. Yeah, mine went painlessly when I did it this morning. Same. Same. As of May 2nd, Utah requires sites that publish or distribute material deemed harmful to minors to perform age verification for all users. The definition of harmful material is very extensive in the law if you want to take a look at it, but mostly it applies to adult porn content. In response to the law, Pornhub.com has started serving a video message on its website explaining its opposition to the Utah law and asking visitors to contact their representative. And if you're a Utah IP address, that's all you get. Uh, the rest of the site is unavailable. Pornhub already verifies ages in Louisiana in partnership with a third-party service called All Pass Trust, so they're not protesting it there. It appears that they believe the Utah law is not well-written and lacks proper enforcement and provisions for device-based verification. Motorola announced its new Edge Plus flagship phone is coming to the U.S. starting at $799. On top of typical flagship specs, it offers a 165Hz 1080p OLED screen, 68 watt wired charging, and IP68 rated weather resistance. The phone will be available unlocked on Amazon and also Best Buy on May 25th and later through carriers Boost Infinite and Consumer Cellular. Yeah, it's a nice looking flagship phone. IBM CEO Arvind Krishna said the company will suspend and slow hiring for some back office jobs, uh, including some things done in human resources. Krishna told Bloomberg, and this is the important part because I've seen every headline misrepresent this. Krishna said, I could easily see 30% of that getting replaced by AI and automation over a five-year period. Now, Krishna said things like workforce composition and productivity evaluation would not be automated. They would automate mundane things like employment verification letters, other paperwork. Basically, IBM is cutting back on jobs, or at least on hiring, in advance of an expected recession, and also planning for future efficiencies. Back office roles amount to 26,000 jobs at IBM. If you take 30%, that would be 7,800, which is the number you keep seeing in headlines. But no, Krishna did not say IBM would replace 7,800 jobs with AI. Yes, there is the potential for that to happen, given what Krishna did say. E-scooter maker Unagi announced its latest version, the Model 1 Voyager. You can buy it for $1,190 or rent it for $89 per month, which includes maintenance and also insurance. It uses the same design as the previous Model 1, but double the range at 25 miles and a system to give you an estimate of how many miles you have left on that battery. Uh, that is a look at the quick hits. All right, let's talk a little bit about this tracking standard. Multiple companies have joined together to propose an industry standard to the Internet Engineering Task Force, a.k.a. the IETF, for unauthorized tracking alerts. So it's a standard for when to provide these alerts, how to detect unauthorized trackers, etc. Uh, basically warning people if a Bluetooth tracker like an Apple AirTag or a Tile Tracker is on their person or in their car or something without their knowledge. 
The group proposing the standard includes Apple, Google, Tile, Samsung, Chipolo, Anchors Ufi, and Pebble Bee. Uh, and if you can think of a tracker that's not in there, uh, let us know. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com because that covers a large majority of them. Features are expected to be complete by the end of the year. And once they are complete in the standard, implemented in both iOS and Android, meaning you won't have to have a separate app in Android to be able to check for Apple AirTags. Uh, that will mean that Apple AirTag alerts will work across those websites or across those operating systems and all other tracker makers like Tile will be able to join the standard and work with those operating system tracking systems as well. Um, Nika, what, what do you think of this industry effort? I think it's probably the best thing to do. When AirTags were first announced, everyone was excited about them. And then, of course, uh, negative uh, what threat actors, if you want to call them, started using uh, uh, AirTags for, for things that AirTags were never meant to be uh, used for. And so people who had um, non-Apple phones um, didn't have a way to identify if an AirTag was on them or unknowingly or if they were in their bag on their car mm. and then there had to be a whole separate app and there was a whole lot of talk about that is apple doing enough to protect people particularly women were the largest um people who were being targeted for this for stalking harassment you know those types of things so i think this joint effort from most of like you said the um app uh, the you know tracking type devices coming together, I think this should hopefully quell some of the discourse and also make people safer um, to use whatever tracking system they like with a certain level of confidence that they'll be safe. Yeah, I, I have a, a fun air tag story. Uh, my dog was staying with a friend of mine uh, a few months ago and the friend wanted to make sure my dog was safe, put a little air tag on my dog's collar. And then everyone forgot about it uh, because then the dog <laughs> was back in my possession. Uh, it was safe and sound. But at one point, uh, because I hadn't really thought about the air tag, I got a little alert in my phone, like, just so you know, there's an air tag that's, you know, with you. Oh, now, right, this it was, wasn't yours. It wasn't mine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it was it, totally, totally above board. Like nothing, right, right. nothing weird was mm -hmm. happening. But if it was something weird that was happening, it was probably going to take me a while to notice that AirTag if I hadn't gotten that notification. However, I use iOS. So if I had, a, a, I don't know, a, a variety of, of you know other mobile devices that could also ping me and be like, heads up, just so you know, I think that's better for everybody. Yeah, yeah. the important part about this is that you don't have to be using a tracker. Uh, and you don't have to think of all the possible trackers someone you would use against you. Once the system is in place, your operating system is either Android or iOS. It's going to let you know. You don't have to do anything. And that's I think that's the key here. Absolutely. Now that we've solved that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of I, I, I was I was thinking about the story earlier of like, OK, well, I think it's. I think, uh, you know, getting more updates on, uh, you know, if a tracker wants to let you know that it is near you, so your whereabouts are being possibly seen by one or more people, all very good. Um, I think that, I don't know, in the same way that smart home devices, we're getting closer to the, the, them all talking better together. This is sort of the same yeah. idea, but very much more in a safety situation. Especially you know, because yeah. in a home situation, you're the one deciding to use the devices. Right. In this situation, it's the nefarious person who's deciding to use the device. And mm -hmm. so they're they're shifting the responsibility off of you to to protect yourself to just be built into the operating system. I think that's good. Matter for trackers. Yeah. Yeah. Matter <laughs> yeah. for trackers. That's like a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah. All right, Nika, it's time for another edition of Teching Wall Black, where you shine a light on a technology leader in the black community that we might not have heard of yet, but we'll be glad that you told us about. So, Nika, who are we highlighting today? Today, we are highlighting Rydiette Abibe. She is the co-founder of Black in AI, which is an organization that is working on increasing the presence of black people in the field of artificial intelligence. Um, Throughout this this uh, the show today, we've talked about AI a couple of different times. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things where we're making sure to. I thought it was important to highlight someone um, who is a minority, who is in this space, and who is working to 
further, you know, um, encourage other um, people of color to be in this space. Because as we've seen already, like I said, throughout the show, um, the the way that AI is really taking over, it's the it's the new hot thing um, in in the tech space right now. Um, additionally, into co-founding this organization, she is um, an assistant professor of computer science at UC Berkeley. She happens to be the first black female professor in the history of the department and the second in the history of the College of Engineering. Additionally, she is a junior fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows, um, which she is the second junior fellow with a, a PhD in CS and the first female computer scientist and the first black computer scientist in that society altogether. Additionally, she is the first Black woman to create uh, to complete a PhD in computer science at Cornell. So lots of firsts here for for her. Um, there's a slew of other awards and honors that is honestly too much to go through <laughs> on uh, on this show right now. But I definitely um, encourage you to go and and check out her work, the work that she's doing in AI, and the way that she is facilitating the inclusion of black people and other people of color um, in this space. Because as we know, um, when everybody is included, especially in new technology, everyone is is the better for it. Yeah. But one of the big problems you hear about with training sets is that they aren't comprehensive in representing the, the world, right? That they might skew in, in one particular way. And so having a diverse set of people working in AI kind of helps correct for that. Uh, you, you know, you've got somebody in there that's like, hey, wait a minute, this this data set doesn't represent me or my family or people who look like me. And so having somebody working to make sure that you include a diverse set of people working a, on AI is a good way to prevent that bias from creeping in or at least, you know, at least reduce it. Absolutely. And a prime example of that is recently um, it in the in the field of art, um, there was an image of a child who drew his to drew a hand and it had like um, like flowers um, sprouting out from it. And uh -huh. it was a brown hand and they used generative um, AI to create a realistic photo of the drawing. I mean, it's obvious when you look at the source, it's the child's image because you can see the crayon, uh -huh. you know, streaks and everything. But when they created the AI image from the, from the source image from the child, the hand was white and female uh -huh. and not uh, uh -huh. black and nondescript because based, mm. it's, it was just like a regular, if you kind of trace the outline of a hand, right. you know, type of hand. But the way that it was able to take that and convert a very obviously brown hand into a white hand. Uh, but the integrity of the image was still intact. The flowers coming out of the fingers, you could definitely tell that that's where that image was sourced. So things like that, because it's all based on the data that it's trained on. So yeah, if it right. doesn't have enough data to train on, it doesn't have an Im it doesn't have a way to identify that, oh, this is a brown hand. So what I create in the AI generative process should be a brown hand as well. Well, last month, The Economist Korea reported that employees of Samsung had uploaded sensitive information to OpenAI's chat GPT on at least three occasions. The first occasion, uh, he was asked to check database source code for errors. The second occasion, asked for code optimization. And the third, uploaded a meeting recording and asked chat GPT to generate minutes. Mm, yeah, okay. In all cases, the data was confidential, though. Oops. And ChatGPT uses data prompts to train its models unless you opt out. Now, at the time of the incidents, the only way to get rid of chat prompts once they're made was to delete the entire user account. Initially, Samsung responded by limiting the length of the prompts its employees could enter. Now, Bloomberg has seen a memo indicating that Samsung has banned employees from using generative AI tools, including ChatGPT, Bing's chatbot, and Google Bard on company-owned devices and any device using the company network. The measure, however, is temporary until Samsung can build better security around chatbot use. OpenAI is slowly 
coming along and adding some uh, additional ways to control the data you add to its prompts. Tom, can you tell us a little bit about those products? Yeah, yeah, they're not terribly user friendly. Uh, to get your data removed without deleting your account, you can try filling out the OpenAI personal data removal request. Uh, it requires a lot of info, like what country's laws apply to you, whether you're a public figure, evidence that your data has in fact been processed, and you have to make sworn statements that your information is ac accurate. Also, if you're not in Europe, they might not honor your request. This is really done in response to the lawsuit that was brought in Italy. If you want to stop collection before you enter prompts, if you want to opt out of that data collection, uh, any user can fill out the user content opt-out request. It's a Google form, uh, and that will prevent your user data from being used to train OpenAI's models. They give you lots of warnings about how this will reduce the effectiveness of your results. and you can also go into ChatGPT's account settings and disable training on your data, though that method will disable your chat history as well. Uh, so these are not these are not terribly user friendly ways uh, to protect your data because OpenAI wants to use that data in the training set. What I thought was <laughs> kind of the first thing that stood out to me about this was you know you hear so much about well AI is gonna uh, you know d d you know take the humans' jobs away. And you've got Samsung employees being like, no, no, it's helping us. This is good stuff. You know, <laughs> yeah. let's let's check some source code for errors. Maybe there are some. Yeah, right. You know, you know, like optimize some code. Maybe, you know, that really boring meeting that we all had to sit through for two hours earlier today, we can generate some minutes from that. But yeah, if you're Samsung, you're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> let's not do that until we can assure that confidential information isn't going into, you know, the larger um I, I don't know, AI uh, pie in the sky and 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 it end up coming back to bite Samsung in the, you know what, at some point, because that's what the company would be afraid of. And honestly, and honestly, it's smart. Um, I think there are not a lot of guardrails on um, the different uses for AI. And I think this is where we can get into a bit of trouble is when we don't have guardrails to protect companies, individuals, um, from, you know, their data being, um, used, uh, incorrectly or without credit, or in this case with proprietary and, you know, information that they don't want out there being susceptible. So I think it's smart of them to temporarily put these blinders on, um, and, uh, and, and and get it fixed, get it working, get it in a secure, safe format, then opening it back up. But playing a little bit of devil's advocate, is that really going to stop folks from using it? Because if you're not on the company network, and if you're not on <laughs> the company device, you can still use there these tools. Yeah. There are ways around it, but I think they're yeah. kind of slowing, you know, putting some hurdles and if in it makes the way of people doing enough. it. <laughs> Yeah, That's, I always think that the same thing when I hear on company devices, it's like, well, OK, so the company says, all right, wasn't us. We did what we had to do. But yes, your employees have other options. Yeah, yeah. It, it, like you said, it, it takes a little extra work. But if it's going to save you a little extra work, maybe it's worth it. I, I think the solution here is either Samsung figuring out a way to, to safeguard this stuff, because honestly, once it gets trained, it's not like the data is in the model. Uh, I think a lot of people have that misimpression. Uh, the The risk isn't the training. The risk is it's sitting unprotected in the data set and somebody gets access to the data set and then finds that stuff in there. So you don't want it to go into an unprotected data set. And I know OpenAI is working on uh, like versions of itself that you can buy and locate in your own company so that you're training it and you're protecting it and it doesn't go into the cloud, it doesn't go anywhere else. feels like Samsung needs something like that. Yep. Well, folks, if you want to join in the conversation, you got some ideas on how Samsung could fix this, fix this, or OpenAI could fix it, get in our Discord. You can join it by linking to a Patreon account. Just become a patron. Patreon.com slash DTNS. Many people are talking or looking <laughs> or talking and looking for an alternative microblogging service. 
Mastodon, one popular option, and it's rolling out new features to make it more appealing. Some folks said, eh, servers, we don't really understand. It's kind of hard to figure out how to join Mastodon. Mastodon says now, when a new user signs up, they'll see two server options, mastodon.social, which is already a very popular one, or pick my own server, which you can already do. Mastodon is also adding things like quote posts, improved search, and groups to make it more like a microblogging service that you might already be familiar with. But the darling of the Technorati last week became Project Blue Sky. So Nika, let's remind folks what Blue Sky is and how it differs from other Twitter alternatives. So Blue Sky started, um, was started by Jack Dorsey, we all know, uh, is, was the uh, CEO of Twitter um, as a project uh, to create a decentralized microblogging system. It was spun out at founding, so no, it's not currently a part of Twitter now. Now, Mastodon is also a decentralized service, but Mastodon is built on an activity pub standard. Blue Sky chose to make its own open standard called AT Protocol. Among other things, the AT Protocol has more robust account portability, compatibility, <laughs> portability, portability compatibility than Activity Pub, with the with the aim to make it easy to move between servers without losing posts, followers, or um, follows. So tell us a few things to know um, about Blue Sky, Tom. Yeah, thanks, Nika. Uh, here are a few things to know about Blue Sky. Uh, <laughs> because it was spun out of Twitter, like Nika told you, it looks a lot like a simplified Twitter. It's going to look very familiar if you get in. It only has one server right now that is run by the Blue Sky project. Uh, so you don't have to choose. And also, it's not really decentralized because there's just the one server at the moment. They do plan to open that up and interoperate with other people on the app protocol. You have to get an invite to join right now. You can't just join in. So yeah, 300,000 people or so have downloaded the Blue Sky app, but there aren't that many users of Blue Sky because a lot of people downloaded it just to get on the wait list. Uh, a few things about how it works. It has a 300 character limit. You can like, reply, and repost. Uh, there's a following feed and a what's hot feed. Following is people you follow. What's hot is just kind of the fire hose. It is algorithmically driven though. There's a mobile app a website at staging.bsky.app and a few third-party apps being developed for it. Users receive one invite code every two weeks that they're on the platform, though the Blue Sky devs have been going around giving out extra invites to folks they see using the platform well. Now, we've all been lucky enough to have somebody invite us to Blue Sky. Uh, Nika, starting with you, what is your impression of this social network? So first, let's see if I can get through this without portability compatibility. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> um, but but uh, so far, um, I've enjoyed it. I think um, because it is so new and there aren't as many people on it, to me, it gives me a lightness of social media because it's not as, you know, like you said, uh, it's just not a dumpster fire. Yeah, it's uh, not crowded. Better, it's not crowded. It's people that you know. You know, it's people that you follow. You know, on Twitter, some of them are are on Blue Sky as well. And so it it's like a streamlined version again because this is um, an invite only beta. That makes sense that that's the way it is. But um, for an initial offering for a new platform, I think they are. From what I can tell of my usage, I think they are going in the right direction. And I expect tons of improvements to come because there are, um, as you said, limitations. Um, but I think where they are and where it seems to be going um, is is so far pretty good. And I have to say, on the portability uh, capability part of it, being able to use my own domain as my username and the process to get that to happen on the app was pretty seamless. I was yeah. pretty surprised how easy it was. Now, I was, when Mastodon first uh, kind of came out as a potential alternative, I went over and I was like, I'll try Mastodon. And then I got over there. And I'm a tech person, so I know kind of how to maneuver my way around. I was like, this is a whole lot 
to get this set up. And I was like, I'm gonna not do this. And I'm just going to go back and suffer through Twitter the way it is. <laughs> so for, so for, for Blue Sky to have that, um, that ease about it was a big winner for me. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of feel the same way you do, Nika. Uh, Mastodon, uh, w- which I'm on, um, was it was not hard for me to understand uh, what uh, how it worked. And it, Annalie knew it was on the show recently and made this great comparison: Mastodon versus email. When you have an email address, nobody talks all that much about like what your email address is. You just use the email protocol. Yeah, and you know you share information, and, might, and we're we're all very used to that. You might use mm-hmm. IMAP, you might use POP three, right? But right. nobody yeah. cares what you're using. Right? Exactly, yeah. like that's yeah. that's behind the scenes, and you know maybe there's you know, some people out there. Well, I I know there are some people out there, you know, still paying for AOL kind of thing. But you know, it took a while for 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 some of the normies to to get on board, but we're all used to that, and. It's not a conversation to be had anymore, and I think that uh, you can you could see Mastodon that way. What I found interesting about Blue Sky was, uh, and <laughs> once I realized that there was a desktop client, I was much happier—not a desktop client, but a web client—because uh, mm-hmm. I don't use I don't actually like microblogging on on mobile all that all that much because I'm usually sitting in front of a computer. But I was like, oh, this is Twitter. It looks exactly like Twitter. Okay, it might. Uh, you know, it's it's the the fundamentals are supposed to be different than Twitter. It's supposed to be based on you know a more um, uh, you know a, a, an open standard, but it looks and acts like Twitter. For the example, design. the design is Twitter. Right? The design, the, I mean, it's it's Twitter. Uh, the you user know, the, experience is definitely Twitter. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not hard. If if you if you're like I liked Twitter and I want something like Twitter, but not Twitter. Blue Sky is for you. Uh, for example, I looked at the What's Hot uh, feed last night. It was all Met Gala photos. Jared Leto in a cat costume. I'm like, this is my stuff. I'm following <laughs> people left and right. You know, it's like, it's like it felt like the fun thing that I like about Twitter. And I'm not saying that Twitter is just a bunch of nonsense because it can be, but it can also be an incredibly um, important news source which I think for our purposes, it, it probably is for, you know, for this panel. And Mastodon is that almost plus, but you still have this barrier to entry for people who go, well, I don't know, really servers and whatever. So I think Mastodon is doing the right thing here, um, trying to just be like, let's simplify this whole thing. Let's stop giving you all these server options because it's confusing people and they think they have to run their own servers type thing. But Blue Sky... Yeah, I don't know. It seems like it seems like the one to watch. It is very clicky right now. Uh, on the one hand, and what do you mean that by that? Clicky. Well, on on the one hand, it, it's low population, so I I feel like oh, my voice can be heard and I can have a conversation without people piling in, like Nika was saying. Uh, but mm-hmm. also, uh, it's a lot of people talking about how cool it is to be in blue sky and let's make sure we make it in our yeah. image before the randos get here. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that's, that's the clicky part of it. Where Which is in Twitter was the exact same way. Yeah. Right. Day. But naturally not exclusive, not exclusively. Right. You didn't need an invite to get on Twitter in the right. early days. Right. Right. Um, right. Yeah. I know that there's some talk about blue skies instance of this staying invite only to control the growth and then opening it up to third parties and saying those those folks can decide whether they want to do invite system or not. Uh, when they launched in March, they said that they would only do the invites until they got their moderation system in order. So I'm, I'm not sure where they're going with that. But I kind of like the idea that they might keep it invite only to control the growth and encourage people to go to other servers once they're interoperating with other servers. I think that would be a good way to get other servers to interoperate. I know originally, I think they thought Twitter might adopt the app protocol. Uh, it does not look like that's going to happen because Twitter cut off their funding last year. They used to get money from Twitter to be developed when Dorsey was in charge. Under Musk, they are not getting that money anymore. So uh, that would have been a great fuel for their growth. I don't know if that's going to happen anymore, though. Yeah, it's really interesting. And especially on kind of like the clicky, and it kind of made me think a little bit about the way Clubhouse was when it first came uh, out. Yeah, It was, you know, that type of experience. But I have to say for me, for the people that I've seen, I, I don't get the sense that, oh, it's like we're trying to, only the cool kids come in. To me, I haven't had that experience. I know some people have seen that and have had that experience. 
it hasn't been that way for me, but I know um, there's another um, coming upcoming that's pretty popular um, social media site um, Spoutable that uh, is uh-huh. is out, and a lot of people are using it. Very, you can pour it over your legacy uh, Twitter check. Um, over there, they have a tool that does that and quite a few (laughs) notable people have signed up and are using it, but there has been a little bit of controversy, uh, on obviously on the Twitter timeline of with the founder, um, what seems to be some people are saying kind of taking shots at blue sky and like some back and forth. So it's, I, I think competition is good for the consumer. So it means that there are different platforms out there that are really trying to create a product that is going to be better for the consumer. So I'm all for it because at the end of the day, you have to, at this point, you have to try different things to find out what platform is going to work for you. And right now it seems like we have some pretty good options out there. I would just encourage the devs at Blue Sky to uh, go invite a few less like-minded people. They seem to be a lot of like-minded people inviting like-minded people, and I think I think you could you could use a, a little more of a mixture there. <laughs> yeah, it's like the bouncer at the club. Come on, you know, <laughs> not just your friends, everybody. Uh, Nika Monford is one of our friends. Uh, always nice to have you on the show, Nika. Let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Um, for the most part, you can find me on all the social media outlet, outlets at Tech Savvy Diva. Um, you can also check out um, my own podcast. is a weekly podcast that I co-host with Terrence Gaines, which is called uh, The Snob OS Show, where we talk about all things Apple and then some other tech as well. So definitely uh, check us out. We um, Our shows come out on Fridays unless you're a Patreon supporter and you get the show on Wednesday live with us. Yeah. How about that? Good to be a patron. Uh, Also, a a special thanks to Chad Johnson, one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. Thank you, Chad. Thank you for all the years of support. Yay. Thank you, Chad. Uh, Chad is one of our patrons, and our patrons can stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. The Writers Guild is on strike, and it's streaming TV's fault. Ah! It was DVDs last time. Uh, So here we are. We're going to talk about that and more on Good Day Internet patrons or people who are just becoming a patron right now. Stick around. You can catch our show at DTNS is live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 2000 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Tomorrow is Wednesday. And you know what that means. Scott Johnson is with us. We'll talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>